The following presentation was recorded by View Digital Media at the inaugural Southeast Linux Fest in Clemson, South Carolina on June 13, 2009. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit southeastlinuxfest.org. Thank y'all so much for coming. I was actually, you know, a little afraid when nobody show up because they had, you know, Linux games and do Ubuntu kernel running right now. Uh, and I know how popular Ubuntu is. Anyhow, uh, this is just a, a real quick primer on uh, TCP IP for the, for the full discussion. Uh, you'll want to check out the link provided here at lizella.net forward slash networking101.txt. Uh, the full... You know, the full thing's available there, and you'll get, you know, a much greater understanding than what I can just do here. For example, uh, in, the, in this presentation, we won't look at a packet in its entire binary form, although in, in the text file here we will. Uh, <clears throat> so I, I basically started doing this class, I guess you would say, on IRC because I was kind of impressed by how many, you know, smart people just didn't know a darn thing about the protocols used for networking across the internet today. Uh, you know, there's a heap of people out there that I respect a lot that know a bunch of junk that I don't know. And, you know, they would think UDP was, you know, guaranteed delivery. And, you know, just, just ridiculous stuff. Or, you know, didn't understand how a routing decision was made. So I, you know, invented this class to sort of uh, answer that. There's a couple, you know, basic terms we go through. I'm sure you're familiar with Node. That's just anything that's actually on a network is a node. And uh, a frame, you'll probably more commonly hear them called, called packets. You know, you talk about a packet doing this or a packet doing that. But when you get down to the low level, uh, it's more often that you're referring to frames. It's basically the same thing. Uh, oftentimes a frame is an incomplete packet or a packet that's that's currently being mangled uh, somewhere along in the stack. <clears throat> uh, there's, there's a whole bunch of layers. There's actually seven in this OSI model, but we're only really interested in five for most uh, basic things. That's the physical layer, the data link layer, the uh, <coughs> network layer, the transport layer, and then the application layer. Uh, the physical layer is it, basically anything you can kick and I used to say that, but now you have wireless and you can't kick the air. You know, you can't kick the air waves, the radio waves. So, uh, but basically the physical layer is what actually transmits a signal. You know, usually you're talking about fiber optic cables or copper cables, but you could also be talking about radio waves. But the physical layer is, is what exists in the real world as a real thing, not as just data. Uh, the data link layer is uh, the the first really interesting layer. The physical layer is kind of boring, you know. It's just it's just here's this stuff, you know. But the data link layer is what actually delivers frames or packets to other computers. Without it, you don't get any delivery whatsoever. And then you have the network layer. That's the first really fun one. That's where all your routing decisions are made. That's what allows you to actually communicate with a computer through an intermediary computer, like a default gateway. Uh, without the network layer, you have no internet. And that was, uh, going back in the day, that was a big failure of Novell's uh, IPX. You know, it just it didn't really have any sort of way to route on the internet. Uh, NetBuoy, if you're familiar with that, you know, Windows uh, machine name, stuff like that, it's not routable. There's no network layer there. That's why you can't, you know, connect to, I don't know, Workstation Dale 53X, you know, across the Internet because there's no network layer. <clears throat> the uh, transport layer, this is uh, where you start to talk about TCP or UDP. And this is the only layer that can guarantee that your data actually arrived intact at the opposite location. Everything else is unreliable transmission, but until you get to the transport layer, this is where we start doing some intelligent hackery that allows us to know that the other end received what we sent and that it was intact when it was received. And the application layer is, 
in a nutshell. It's just the application. It's whatever actually makes the data portion of the frame or the packet. Uh, there's there's the session layer, and there's one other that's never really used as well. But they're really usually restricted to things like multicast, and, and we're just not going to get into them because they're not of practical importance here. All right, the first label we're going to look into big is the physical layer. Like we said, it can be anything from radio waves to laser beams to copper wire to fiber optics. Uh, but basically, your Cat5 cable and all it is the most common. That's where you see, you know, you go into a network closet or you have a switch at home or your cable modem. There's copper cable coming out of that going to your computer because it's cheap and it's reliable. You know, it's, it costs a lot to make fiber optic cable to run, you know, short distances. So most everyone just uses copper Cat5 or Cat5e, Cat6, something like that. Uh, in the physical layer, we're just going to pay attention to Cat5 here for, for copper because uh, we just don't have time to delve into fiber optics and, and you know, Wi-Fi, things like that. But in... Uh, in Cat5 or any sort of copper transmission, the fluctuations in voltage, fluctuations in voltage, excuse me, I had some beers at lunch, they uh, register as your binary digits. So if you look at this, what we have here is 110, basically the number what? Six, that'd be one, two, four, yeah, six. So uh, as you can see here on this graph, and this is not, 100% accurate, but the blue line sort of here represents your baseline. That's your no value line, I guess you would say. If the voltage fluctuation is above that, it registers as a 1. If it's below that, it registers as a 0. So you have this sine wave, you know, going back and forth basically, that determines whether uh, the signal is interpreted as a 1 or if it's interpreted as a 0. It's important to remember that in the physical layer, everything is analog. It's just interpreted digitally. You know, there's no way to transmit one, no way to transmit zero. You have to transmit a voltage above a certain value or below a certain value, and that's interpreted as a one or a zero. Now, uh, in the physical layer, you got a whole bunch of devices, your network interface cards, uh, repeaters, these are just basically, uh, once you get a signal out so far, you start to lose uh, voltage. It's called voltage drop. You just get so much resistance from the wire. So after you get out a certain distance, you need some sort of repeater there that will then, you know, up the voltage on the line basically so that the signal gets further out and gets reliably delivered. There's also hubs. We really don't use these much anymore because they suck. Uh, it's basically like splitting one cable so that it delivers to multiple places. You know, usually you got a cable, it's got one end over here and one end over here. And if you can only send between those two ends, it's, it's not, you know, really interesting. There's no sense in routing between just two places. You know, you don't really need a whole lot to say, send to Bob if Bob's the only other person in the world, you know. Uh... So a hub basically sort of splits that cable so it puts multiple ends on it. Uh, we'll get into a little bit more as to why hubs suck in the uh, next section. The data link layer. Okay, this is the very first portion that uh, things start to get interesting. If anybody has a question, don't raise your hand. Just shout. I won't get offended. You know, just speak up. I'll stop. Uh, the data link layer includes... Uh, something y'all may have heard of, MAC addresses, media access control. Uh, every device that you know operates on the data link layer has a MAC address, and it's set by the factory unless you're good and you can change it. But uh, any time a frame is sent out and it's destined to some other computer, it gets a source and a destination MAC address set. The source address, you know, the source MAC address is, of course, your MAC address, whichever machine's actually sending the frame. And the destination address is whichever one it's going to. That might not be its final destination, it's just the next place it's going to. 
And we'll see that a little bit more in the next layer when we start to talk about Rowdy. Uh, but uh, as we go on, you know, MAC addresses are unique 48-bit numbers. And uh, to give you an idea, you know, we're starting to run out of IPv4 space. And that's a 32-bit number, so you've got a whole other 16 bits to deal with. Uh, so we're okay on MAC addresses. They're not a big big problem. Uh, it's important to realize the MAC address is the only address that is used to deliver a packet or frame. The IP address means nothing as far as where the packet actually ends up. The IP address is just, determine, is just determining where uh, to route it to and if it's on your subnet and then ARP takes over. We'll see that a little bit later too. Um, this is why this is why hubs suck. Lands that are connected with hubs. A LAN is a local area network. You know, we got uh, you know this laptop hooked up to some other laptop upstairs, and there's a server, and it's all contained in this building. That would be a local area network. Uh, if you connect that with hubs, every time one machine sends a frame, it's going to go to every other computer on that local area network. So every other computer has to deal with it. Uh, each computer that receives a frame checks the destination MAC address. If that matches that node's MAC address, it says, hey, this frame is meant for me. And then it accepts it and sends it on up the stack. If it doesn't, it just discards it to the bit bucket. You know, the frame's gone as far as that node's concerned. And that's, you know, okay for small networks, but when things start to build up, you get a lot of collisions, a lot of repeated data. And so there's two things that are used at the data link layer to, uh, to uh, mitigate this. The first is bridges. Uh, these are kind of old school. They're not used as much anymore for their original purpose. What you would do is you would have one hub, you know, over here on the left, and one hub way over here on the right, and a bridge sat in between. And the bridge makes an intelligent decision whenever it sees a frame. It says, does this frame need to go across me? And if it does, it lets it across. If it doesn't, it just drops it. So if you have one machine over here connected to this hub on the left, talking to another machine on the left, all these machines connected to the hub over here on the right never see that frame because the bridge right here in the middle stops it. Same if you got machines on the right talking to machines on the right. The ones on the left never see it. Uh, and that was a big performance boost because you didn't have all this replication of data. And remember, when, when you've got physical layers here, you're talking about having every machine get the same binary ones and, two, ones and zeros, ones and twos. Man, that would be an increase in, in throughput. <laughs> get tertiary computers in here. But uh, every machine basically has to see, and, uh, see the same ones and zeros at the same time. Uh, with bridges, you now have the ability for two machines on the left to talk to each other at one time, while two machines on the right are talking to each other at the same time. A switch goes a little bit further. It's sort of a combination of a hub and a bridge. Uh, you know, hubs might have 48 ports on them. Well, a switch is basically a hub with a bridge on every port so that whenever, you know, the, let's say Alan and I'm plugged into one and, uh, you know, I want to talk to camera guy who's plugged into two, uh, I can send a packet and the switch says, well, camera guy's on port two and it just sends it down port two. All y'all other people, three through 48, Y'all don't ever see it, don't know it exists, and in fact, y'all are able to talk to one another at the same time because the media isn't being reserved. The switch has, you know, intelligently handled the frame and just routed it to the one place it needed to go. It does this by doing an ARP lookup, and I'm not going to go into all this at this time, but uh, you shouldn't rely on switches to do uh, security work because... Uh, if you arc flood a switch, it will either shut down entirely and not pass any frames or it will operate as a hub, depending on the make and model. So, you know, just be aware just because you have a switch doesn't mean somebody can't plug in on another port and listen to you. 
Uh, it just depends on how good your switch is. If nothing else, they can dosh your land. But uh, the network layer. As I wrote here, this is probably the most difficult to learn layer, but it's also the most rewarding. This is the first place that allows you to, from one computer in, you know, one part of the world, Lysilla, Georgia, and that's right, it's Georgia, not Georgia, it's Georgia, to talk to someone in Clemson, South Carolina, uh, because it allows you to decide whether that machine is, I guess you would say, near or far, whether it's on my local area network or whether it's not, and then to consult a routing table and decide where to send the packet to next and allow someone else to send it on further down the line. Uh, without this layer, you could only talk with your local area network. That's why NetBuoy, you know, uh, Windows, uh, SMB, well, SMB's now done over TCP, but in the days of Windows 95, Windows 98, Windows NT, you know, you couldn't do any sort of, you know, file sharing across a LAN, at least without WINS, because there was no way to uh, encapsulate it. There was no way to route it. Um, frames are routed based on their destination IP address, and we should see that in the next couple slides here. Uh, people tend to think of the network layer as only including internet protocol, but, but there's some others as well. And some protocols like ICMP, they actually kind of straddle the network and, and the uh, transport layer. We'll get to those in a moment. Uh, IPv4 addresses, those are 32-bit numbers. That's 2 to the 32nd power possible IP addresses. Don't make me do that math, but it's a big number. Uh, IPv6, 128-bit numbers. That's a huge friggin' number. <laughs> you know, I mean, if you took if you took every molecule of water in, in the ocean, and, and you know, the Earth is covered 75% by ocean, and you gave each water molecule a unique IP address, you still wouldn't run out. You know, so once we switch to IPv6, knock on wood. We won't need any more IP addresses for at least my generation. Uh, we're only going to discuss IPv6 here because, you know, if I actually put a 128-bit number on there, I mean, you can see what this 32-bit number is. I'd run out of room on the, on the slide. Uh, IP addresses are generally listed as four octics. You see one right here. This is probably something you're very common with. you got a Linksys route or something like that. 192.168.1.1. Uh, we split it up into four octics. What that means is there are four different 8-bit numbers. And with 2 to the 8th powers, 256, that allows you to do any number from 0 to 255. That's why you don't see any IP addresses like 300.497. You know, you can only go up to 255 in 8-bits. Um but computers don't separate it like that. The computer will actually treat it as one 32-bit binary number. It's not decimal, it's binary, so actually, you know, 110 blah, 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 one is 192.168.1.1. That's how the computer sees it. Well, how any network device, whether it's a computer or a switch, whatever. Um, <coughs> Subnetting, and we're going pretty fast, so if y'all don't understand anything, you know, holler. Uh, subnetting is probably the toughest part of networking. Uh, it used to be real easy because we were real stupid, and uh, we only had three possible subnets, 255.0.0.0, and, you know, 255.255.0.0, and 255.255.255.0, and that was it. You know, you could have either 16,000 addresses, 255,000 addresses, or a million. And that was it. You know, there was no sort of fine-tuning, and that kind of exacerbated the problem as far as us running out of IP addresses with IPv4, because I think Ford has a couple million addresses, and IBM probably has 10 or 12, 
and you know who knows uh if gm goes bank well gm did go bankrupt maybe they got a bunch of ip addresses we can get back <laughs> uh <laughs> so what yeah 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 well then you got the white house with a million ip addresses and who needs that uh Subnets, they're, they're denoted basically the same way IP addresses are. We got, you know, four octics, you know, 255, 255, 255, zero is probably the most common you've dealt with. But it can be any number from all zeros to all ones. We'll show that in a moment. Uh, you'll also sometimes see them as masked, 192.168.1.1 slash 24. Uh, once you actually look at this, the way a computer looks at it, you'll understand that slash 24. If you look at it as a 32-bit binary number, you'll notice the first 24 digits are all 1. And then the last 8 are all 0. So if you do slash 24, that means your first 24 straight numbers are all going to be 1. And you can't subnet it where you have like 1101. It has to be one straight from the beginning to zero straight at the end, or it's not a proper subnet. And I have no idea what your computer will do with it. Um, this basically, and I might need, yeah, there we go. Okay, I got something in the next slide, and I'll d demonstrate this better. But uh, when you look at the IP address and the subnet mask together, it's easy to determine what IP addresses. <laughs> you can communicate basically what, what IP addresses are local and which ones are remote. Uh, this 192.168.11 slash 24, it can contact all addresses between dot .o and dot .255 because uh, the bit mask has hidden the 192.168.1 part. We we'll see that right here. If you look at the two numbers together, the top one is the IP address the bottom one is the subnet mask. And everywhere in the subnet mask that you see a 1, all those numbers in the IP address are effectively masked. In other words, the computer doesn't look at those uh, as local addresses. So the 192, the 168, and the 1 are ignored in this example because they're masked out by the subnet. And the only one that's important is the final dot one on the end. Uh, so when you look at that, look at it this way, you can see, you know, if you total up all the possible binary combinations for those last eight binary numbers, you got 256 combinations from zero to 255. If we, uh, you know, added another bit to the subnet mask or subtracted another bit, it affects which machines are considered local by the computer. Um, If a frame is not considered local, uh, basically if the frame is not in this subnet here, if it's not in this 192.168.1 subnet, then the computer or the node knows it has to use a gateway to reach the final destination. It has to use a router, essentially. Uh, we got some other network layer protocols, there's ICMP, which kind of straddles the network layer and the transport layer. Uh, it's used for trace routes, pings, time to live expired, junk like that. Uh, there's also ART, which uh, resolves IP addresses to MAC addresses. Uh, we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on that here. If you want to actually learn more about how that works, you'll have to check the uh, slide in the beginning. Uh, how much time do I got here? Oh, I'm good. Well, I knew I was good. I just got plenty of time. <laughs> uh, the transport layer. Here we go. This is probably what you you've probably heard the most about, and in some ways, it's the it's the least uh, interesting, at least to me. Uh, this is where you have TCP and UDP. You may have heard three-way handshake, four-way handshake, all that good junk. But this is the first and only layer that can optionally, that's important, it can optionally guarantee the data was delivered and intact. It can't always, well, you can disable that guarantee. Basically, 
TCP can guarantee that your data got where it got to. UDP is the brain dead cousin of TCP and can. It just says, duh, let me send data. TCP sends data, looks for responses, and, you know, basically. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, any time that you don't really care so much about data delivery. Uh, it's not a big deal if you're streaming a video or streaming some audio if, you know, a couple split seconds are lost. Uh, TCP adds so much additional overhead that in that situation you would probably actually lose more doing TCP, at least in a streaming way, than you would with UDP. Also, VPNs. And, and some of you, I'm sure, have probably looked at using Secure Shell or something for a VPN. Any VPN that uses TCP is by definition stupid. Uh, you should use UDP for a VPN. Um, and I'll get into, well, I'll go ahead and say the reason why. If you have TCP and it's doing all these additional checks to guarantee data delivery, and it's encapsulated inside a VPN that's doing all these additional checks, to guarantee delivery, there's no point in doing that twice. If you're not worried about, you know, your data getting delivered, just use UDP. And if it's encapsulated in UDP, you don't care. If you are worried about it getting delivered, do it in TCP. And if it's encapsulated in UDP, you still have that checking. So you're not adding all this additional packet uh, overhead. Uh, so it's just better to use something like OpenVPN, which is UDP by default. Although you can do it with TCP, but you're brain dead if you do. Uh, so the UDP is smaller packets? Yes, actually. Not just smaller packets, but uh, as we'll see, there's a lot of uh, special frames with TCP that add to overhead. Plus, uh, TCP does some... Uh, hackery to determine if we're transmitting data too fast and if we are it backs off UDP just sends it out as quick as it can uh, so there's no need to do that check twice and if we get to a point where we're sending data too fast and we have TCP encapsulated in TCP it slows down twice at an exponential rate so you get much less throughput with a TCP VPN uh, Okay, now I got off track. Uh, either either TCP or UDP, uh, they uh, add some information to the frame so that it can actually be delivered to the proper application. Uh, you know, that application might be Firefox. It might be DHCPD. It might be, you know, uh, Claws Mail. Or it, it could be, I don't know, Apache or Postfix, SendMail, anything. But without that, uh, without that additional data, there's no way for the receiving computer to know what application to give the data to. Uh, it's responsible for handing off data between applications in the network layer, basically. That last point was kind of dry. Um, in order to guarantee delivery, Transport Control Protocol, TCP, it uses some, some pretty nice hackery. Uh, it, it has a lot of, well, really mainly two handshakes that guarantee that you're able to communicate with uh, whatever machine you're trying to talk to and for actually shutting that communication down. Uh, also, uh, there's things called ACK packets. Those are acknowledgments, A-C-K. Uh, and every frame has to have an acknowledgment, an ACK packet. So if I send some data to, I don't know, barnow.lizella.net, my home firewall, with TCP, I will know it got that when I get the acknowledgement packet back. If I don't get that acknowledgement packet back, there's one of two things that can ha have happened. Either Barnow, the, com the computer I'm trying to talk to, never got my original packet in the first place, in which case I need to resend it, or two... Uh, it got it and sent the acknowledgement, but I never got the acknowledgement, so I have no way of knowing which of those two happened. So I'll just resend the packet anyway. Uh, that way I can guarantee that the packet eventually gets through once I get that acknowledgement. 
up till now, we've had no way of knowing whether the receiving computer ever actually got what we sent to them. Now we do because we have these acknowledgement packets. And this is where you also have, if you talk about, you know, TCP VPNs, you're going to get an acknowledgement packet for whatever you're encrypting and an acknowledgement packet for the encrypted connection. So it's twice the amount of data. 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 Well, apparently I did have too much beer. Uh, it's twice the amount of data you'd have to send across the network, and it's just tangling things up without adding more information. Um, there's four types of frames we're going to look at here, but there's not just four types. There's uh, explicit congestion notification and some additional types, but uh, we're mainly just going to look at four, SIN, ACK, FIN, and RST. Uh, to start with, we'll look at the uh, three-way handshake. This is what's used uh, to initiate a connection. And it's where we'll first see the send packet, and you shouldn't ever see it outside of a three-way handshake. Uh, let's say I want to talk to Google.com on port 80 on a TCP connection. I'm wanting to do a web search. Firefox starts up and immediately sends a send packet to Google, Google.com. Once Google receives that package, that's the receiving node there, it sends back a send at packet. In other words, both the send and the acknowledgement packet. Uh, send stands for synchronize. Both the synchronize and acknowledgement uh, fields are, are checked, essentially. They're one. And uh, once we get that, we send back an acknowledgement to Google saying, hey, we got it. So not only do we know that Google is receiving from us, but Google knows that we're receiving from it. And at this point, we can start actually transmitting data. Um, that first acknowledgement is sometimes called a sin ack ack if you ever hear, hear that, or a sin double ack. That's what they're talking about. Uh, there's a four-way handshake as well for uh, uh, closing down a connection. Uh, basically, the fin packet for finish, it works sort of like the sin. Uh, if I'm wanting to close down from Google, I'll send them a fin packet. And they'll reply with a fin ack. And at this point, the connection is, is what's called half open or half closed. If you're, you know, the glass is half full or half empty kind of guy. Uh, once you send a fin packet, you say, hey, I'm not sending any more data to you. I'm done sending data. But you can still send data back to me. Like, say I'm doing a WGIT on some huge, you know, I don't know, torrent or, you know, DVD or something. Uh, I may send uh, a CINAC and say, just give me, I don't know, uh, southeastlinuxfest.tar.gz, all the videos from here. And then I'll send a finish because I don't want anything else. But for the next hour, hour and a half, the uh, other machine will continue to send me the data that I requested, and then we'll close it out with its own finished packet. Um, there's also the RST packet, which is basically like the silver bullet. It says, kill the connection right now. Once you get an RST, everything shuts down. Uh, so you can see at this point, uh, node 2, we'll call that Google. Google, they've finished sending us or Clemson is, or whoever is finished sending us all these videos, they finally send us a fin packet, we send them back a fin act, and we're done. Um, both nodes will fully terminate the TCP connection. Um, During the period when uh, one side has sent a fin, yeah. and it's receiving packets, does it continue to send acts for those packets? Yes, absolutely. It always it's continues to send acknowledgments. It just basically says, I'm not going to request any more data. I'm not going to send you any more data, but it will still send acknowledgments. Uh, data frames, uh, this is 
you know, we're, we're actually talking about the data we're receiving as far as these videos. They don't have any particular special flags. They're just bulk data, essentially, with a port number and a sequence number and some other stuff. I wish I had space on all these slides to uh, show the actual things, but we'll see a little bit more in some of these later ones, I do believe. Yeah. Anyhow, uh, every time you get a data data frame, even if the even if the session is half closed, like you said, you have to send an acknowledgement so the sender knows, hey, uh, we're uh, we're getting data. They're receiving it. Again, this is only with TCP. With UDP, they just say, duh, I assume we got it. Uh, if you don't ever see that act frame, that acknowledgement, they'll resend the data. Ports layer five. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry, four. Physical data network, yeah, four. Transport layer. That's basically your port, and, and we'll, we'll show you right here. That's what the port is for, essentially. Uh, the kernel will create a socket for that port and, and send the data through its filters just to get the data out and then sends it to whatever application to open that port. Uh, but that's how TCP communicates with the application layer, with whatever actually wanted the data, like in my example, WGET or Firefox or uh, send mail or clause mail or whatever. Uh, every TCP frame, it's got a source port and a destination port. So if I start up Firefox and I want to, I don't know, do a Google search, it will set a destination port of port 80. That's the World Wide Web port, HTTP port. Uh, you got a question, mister? Sorry. All right, no trouble, no trouble. I ain't real picky. Uh, and it'll set a, a source port. That's whatever. It's it's some random high number port like oh, thirty two thousand five hundred sixty eight that Firefox just chose or the kernel assigned to Firefox to use randomly as its source port. And when it gets any sort of data back from that, it knows what application to send it to. Uh. And that's basically it. They tell the receiver know where to send the data portion of the frame. UDP, here we go. We get to pick on, you know, my brain dead incest cousin. Uh, it's the brain dead cousin of UDP. It has ports, and that's about it. It doesn't do any sort of handshakes, it doesn't do any sort of acknowledgements. It just sends data out as fast as it can. Uh, which is a good bit faster than TCP in some cases. In some cases, it's slower because the you know the transmission media is just unreliable, and you never really ever get everything you wanted. You wouldn't want to use UDP for downloading, you know, our, our video stuff here because when you start to get some network congestion, it's just going to get worse and worse and worse, and eventually time out. You've only got half the video. TCP is smart enough to slow down and speed up when it needs to. Uh, and I don't really have time to go through that whole algorithm as how, how it does that. But uh, basically, uh, UDP, real good for voice over IP, streaming media, VPNs, anything where you don't need to guarantee that data was reliably sent for whatever reason uses the same port numbers, even though these are actually different ports, it's in, in basically the same way as TCP. Uh, it just knows what socket or what application to hand the data off to by those port numbers. Is there uh, sequencing, sequencing information in, the, in these things so that if one gets there ahead of time? In uh, UDP, Yes, there is a sequence number. I'm almost positive. I have to double check. In TCP, there is. So that if you get packets out of order, it can put them back in order. And actually, every acknowledgement has that same sequence number. In TCP, every 
acknowledgement packet has that same sequence number, so the, the sending computer knows which ones actually were received and which ones weren't, and can just, you know, it can intelligently resend the one that got misdelivered, and it'll show up later, and they can reassemble. So we should see in a few later, yeah, we'll see some of the actual uh, sequence numbers, acknowledgement numbers, all that stuff here in just a moment when we actually handcraft our very own frame. Uh, the application layer, this is real boring. It's basically DHCP, DNS, Firefox, HTTP. It's just whatever actually makes the payload for the frame. And since we're not interested in, you know, what that actual data is, we're not really interested in the application layer. You know, we want to know how to route, how to send, that sort of stuff. So it's kind of boring. Uh, but you sometimes see, uh, you know, like Firefox will request a port number to send to. Uh, like in this case, you'll see Lizella.net colon 8080. It's saying instead of normally sending to 80, I can send to 8080 or 443 or whatever, you know. Uh, it's not hard-coded by the application. The application can actually check and ask, you know, the kernel to go ahead and, cr and craft this packet to connect to a different port than usual. All right. If everybody's still with me, we're going to go through the fun process of making our very own baby packet. And we'll see just how fast she grows up. Uh, we're going to start here with the application layer. And you can see right down here at the bottom, uh, I've cut everything off at 32 bits. Uh, you start with uh, 0 and go all the way out to 1 there at the end. That's actually 31. So each one of these little diagrams you see in, in the next few slides will be actually 32 bits in length and you'll see where everything actually is in the real packet. So if for some ungodly reason, you know, you develop the ability to read binary ones and zeros on the wire, you'll be able to figure out where everything actually is without using TCP dump. Um, basically, okay, our application layer, we'll call it SendMail or Firefox, whatever. It sets the payload. And here I've just said the payload's 32 bits. It's real uninteresting. Maybe it's the number four. Uh, but, you know, we don't really care what the payload is. We don't need values for it. So uh, we're just going to go on and start wrapping the, the packet up. Uh, as we go down each layer in the stack, to the transport layer, to the network layer, to the data link layer, we're going to add things to this payload to get it on down to its next destination. And the first thing we'll do is we'll add the port numbers, sequence numbers, flags, yada yada, junk that TCP adds. So you can see the first 16, the first 16 binary places are reserved for the source port, which is why ports can only go up to 65,575 to the 16th power. And then the next 16 are destination port, same basic deal. And then you got sequence number and acknowledgement number. Personally, I have no idea why they have both of these in the same packet. I would think you could use just one 32-bit number here, and whether the flag says it's an ACK or not, you know, decide whether it's a sequence or an acknowledgement number. But apparently the guys that, uh, you know, created TCP thought differently. Uh, so we have a few other flags here, DMRS, we're not going to worry about all that stuff. Flags, that's where we actually set whether it's a send packet, a fin packet, an acknowledgement, a reset, an RST, uh, all that stuff. They're actually binary ones or zeros. So you have a, a send zero or send one, an acknowledgement zero or acknowledgement one, and based on whether it's a one or zero, tells the receiving node, is this an acknowledgement packet? Is this a finished packet? Is it a synchronization packet? That's where all those are coming in. And when you actually do filtering, you know, in, in NetFilter or, or, you know, if you're lead enough to use OpenBSD, PF, 
uh, you know, when you start checking flags, that's what you're actually looking for. It's saying, is this bit one or is it zero? If you say, you know, I don't want send packets from anything else or I don't want uh, anything but send packets unless they're already established, you say, well, if send ain't one, don't accept it unless it's already established. That's where all that logic comes in. It just looks at that one bit and is able to make an intelligent decision. Uh, the window, it's not really that important. It's sort of like a sizing thing. Uh, I can't really explain it all. Checksum, basically sort of like MD5 checksum. It just says, hey, here's a little checksum. If some bits are flipped, this might catch it. And urgent pointer, we're not really going to go into. It's uh, sometimes used with explicit congestion notification. Uh, not really all that important. And then you can see payload down here. I've actually done the little curly braces. So you can see this is actually from the last time we did. Uh, once we've added all this binary information, we then step down to the network layer. And uh, first thing we'll see down here at the very bottom, I just did the TCP header and payload because I couldn't fit everything on one slide. And, you know, the text file online, you'll be able to look at it all and read it all in binary and hexadecimal form uh, and really get an idea of where you're, you know, where you're at. This has got a buttload of flags, don't it? Uh, you've got version, header length, uh, type, total length, identification number, some flags, fragmentation offset, time to live, protocol header check, source IP, destination IP address, and then your TCP header and your payload. Whole bunch of junk in uh, the network protocol. The most important things are the source IP address and the destination IP address. If you'll notice, there's no subnetting information in the packet. No subnetting information whatsoever. Often we don't even know what the subnet is for the destination IP address and what it is for our source IP doesn't matter for the router. Uh, basically when we send a, uh, well, we'll show you that in the next thing. Version, if we're talking about IPv4, it's going to be four minutes. I mean, uh, four if we're talking about IPv6, it's six. You know, you get the idea. And we're down to two minutes, so I'm going to, you know, go fast. Don't ask questions. Uh, <laughs> once we get down here, we have destination MAC address and source MAC address. You can see they're 48-bit numbers. That's why they take up more than a half on each one. And then you got to check some as well. If we look right here, the most important thing for you to understand, based on the destination IP address, we set our destination MAC address. It might not be the MAC address for our eventual destination. It'll often be the MAC address for the next hop, our gateway, and the next gateway after that. Uh, wow, we did get through it. <laughs> uh, but basically what we have, uh, like say, my, local area, my computer on my local area network connection, and if I run long, just shout. Uh, if I want to send a packet to Google... Yeah, 30 seconds. I am going to run long. Uh, if I want to send a packet to Google, I don't know what Google's MAC address is. And even if I did, it wouldn't help me because the MAC address isn't routable. So what I do, I, I know Google isn't on my local area network. I know my default gateway is, so I set the destination MAC address to match my default gateway. Once it gets that packet, it strips off this uh, data link layer and says, well, I don't know where to get to uh, Google, but I know somebody who does. So it sets the destination MAC address to be the next hop closer to Google. And then it gets it and does the same thing until it eventually gets to Google. That's how they go one hop at a time. And you'll notice that you never actually send to the, uh, the uh, IP address. You always are sending to the MAC address. Uh, and yeah, you can, you can stop me now. I'm pretty sure my 30 seconds are up.
Uh, any other questions or you want to holler at anybody, you can always catch me afterwards. I'm, I'm not hard to spot. Uh, bring, bring beer and red man and I'll talk to you all day. <laughs> this work was recorded by View Digital Media and is licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution, share alike version 3.0. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit southeastlinuxfest.org.